Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm uh, Brad Graham, the co-owner of the store, along with my wife, uh, Lisa Muscatine, and we're delighted to uh, have with us uh, Stephen Hahn, uh, who's here to talk about his new book, Illiberal America, A History. Steve's an, uh, an accomplished uh, historian who teaches at uh, New York University and studies American political and, and social movements. His previous books have dealt with such subjects as the roots of Southern populism, the social history of rural America, and American imperial conquest and capitalistic development in the 19th century. Uh, one of his books uh, a couple of decades ago, A Nation Under Our Feet, uh, about black political traditions that emerged out of uh, slavery, won both the Pulitzer in History and the Bancroft Prize. Uh, in illiber in um, illiberal America, uh, Steve begins by noting that the book's title is uh, sort of an oxymoron. Uh, America as a nation has tended to be associated with liberalism, uh, particularly with regard to rights and politics. And yet, as Steve goes on to recount uh, in his book, illiberal tendencies took hold in America centuries ago, uh, well before what we would call uh, liberalism even appeared. Uh, of course, there's um, there's a lot of talk nowadays, um, a, lo a lot of concern being expressed about the prominence of uh, illiberal trends uh, in, in our politics, uh, about an embrace of authoritarianism, the spread of nationalist uh, attitudes, advocacy of cultural hierarchies and uh, homogeneity. Um, often this illiberalism is portrayed as a backlash against modern liberalism and a tradition of freedom and, and individual rights. Uh, but looking back over several hundred years of American life, Steve argues compellingly in his book that illiberalism has been a central and influential part of, of America's political and, and cultural development and has long competed with the ideals of, of democracy and equality. Uh, it's been evident in such manifestations as, as slavery, the ethnic cleansing of native peoples, anti-Catholicism, anti-Semitism, anti-Mormonism, and, and certainly J uh, Jim Crow. Uh, so so what's, what's Steve's point in focusing on this illiberal side of American history? Uh, it's not, uh, he writes, to paint a dark and damning picture of the United States but rather to emphasize what obstacles the struggle to advance universal rights and combat racism and poverty have had to overcome and what still vulnerable foundations present day liberalism rests on in this country. As a review in the New York Times said, Steve's book, quote, makes an important case for vigilance in the face of extremism and warns against telling the history of the United States as one of inevitable progress. Uh, in conversation uh, with Steve, we're very fortunate also to have with us uh, Gene Robinson, uh, whose own astute analysis and uh, graceful writing is on uh, regular display in his columns uh, in, the, in the Washington Post. Uh, during Gene's mere 44 years <laughs> with the Post, uh, he's also covered City Hall, reported from Europe and South America, and edited the style section. Uh, he started writing a column in 2005, and uh, four years later, uh, won the Pulitzer for, for his uh, commentary. Uh, additionally, he's written three books, and if you watch uh, MSNBC, uh, you've uh, certainly seen him frequently as a, as a political analyst. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming uh, Steve and Gene. Well, um, this is this is working. This is on. Good. Um, uh, welcome and thanks, everybody, for coming coming out. I'm, um, uh, I don't do these very often, but I was uh, delighted when asked to, to come and uh, share this discussion with Steve Hahn, um, who is uh, 
not only a a friend of mine, but also one of the great uh, historians of our time, in my opinion, um, as uh, evidenced by his Pulitzer Prize. Um, and, and I'm particularly excited about uh, this book uh, because I just thought your liberal America was, um, is, is a really important book. And, you know, I mean, let's just, you know, uh, let's acknowledge the elephant in the room immediately, right? Uh, you know, I have, um, since the Donald Trump phenomenon began, like everybody else, I have been like, who ordered that? Where did that come from? Um, uh, and I always had the sense that it was, it was not a, not a root cause, but a symptom, that it was a symptom of something deeper and more systematic, but but that's as far as I ever got. I could I could never get to kind of what that is. And I think I think the, what is the the real achievement of this book, and I think it's an important achievement, is Steve. I think you have you have identified, diagnosed, and and described the pre-existing condition uh, that 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 leads us to where we are today. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming. And I must say, it's a really a great honor to share a stage here uh, with Gene Robinson, who I uh, had the good fortune of working with, and whose uh, writing has always been a great inspiration. So and thank you for the nice words about the book. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so when did you? Was that your inspiration? Did you want? Did you like want to explain? Like what's going on in this country now, and, and when did when did you start working on this book? Well, uh, in some ways, I've been writing about this subject all of my life as a historian, but mostly from the point of view of those who are on the receiving end uh, of liberalism, uh, since my work has, you know, largely been about humble white and black folk uh, who were struggling in a variety of ways and who were developing politics to push back and create uh, a different world for themselves. But it is, um, I have to say that um, during the Trump uh, campaign, it, it wasn't Trump so much. It was the way in which he was received by a lot of observers and journalists and the constant um, uh, point of, how this violated liberal democratic norms. Now, as a historian, I sort of wondered what that was. And I think most historians uh, who are serious and who have a pretty good understanding of the long, even political history of the country, uh, know how the idea of liberal democracy is not necessarily a norm. And uh, certainly by the time that Trump was running, I mean, just think, uh, if you just looked at the Supreme Court, uh, the court intervened in an election to determine the outcome very quickly. Uh, Citizens United opened the spigot uh, to big money. Uh, the Voting Rights Act was undermined. State legislatures across the country were uh, restricting voting uh, rights in a way that kind of harked back. Uh, to the late 19th and early 20th century when there was massive disfranchisements not only in the South uh, but in other parts of the country. So I thought, okay, I mean, maybe there's something to write about. And so one of the things I was really interested in doing apropos of this violation of liberal democratic norms was to try to decenter liberalism in American history, which is to say, you know, even critics of liberalism or the so-called liberal tradition kind of see it as running, you know, kind of through. And uh, they may criticize it. They may uh, talk about how it's been betrayed or gone off the rails. But by and large, they seem to acknowledge that that was really at the center of American social and political life. So I was interested in kind of refocusing attention on what you might call you know, the range of political currents that flowed across the country from very early on, 
uh, liberalism eventually being one of them, but by no means uh, the only one or at certain points not the dominant one. And I had also been reading, uh, because of the moment, um, some of the literature on illiberalism, uh, which of course was you know, um, being churned out pretty much since the 1990s, and uh, mostly by social scientists, political scientists especially, and journalists, uh, who were very deeply worried about what was going on, mostly outside the United States. A classic article by uh, Fareed Zakaria in the 1990s didn't talk about the United States at all. It was about what was going on in Europe and what was going on in Latin America. So um, I, I came to think that this was a way of talking about a deep historical phenomenon without being a historical, which is to say, I thought illiberalism, and I'm happy to talk more about how I understood that, was a very capacious concept, that it could embrace a variety of social circumstances and ideas, forms of organization, um, and was also flexible enough so that there was change over time, which I was really, I mean, was really important. I mean, I did not want to write a history without history. I didn't want to write, nor did I think it was worth writing. And um, uh, some kind of book which said it was, it kind of established itself early on, and that's it. And, uh, you know, there's no question that many features of what you could call a liberalism pop up. Mm -hmm. you know, now and again. But I tried in the book to to talk about, you know, how illiberalism uh, manifested itself in many different contexts and how it was transformed over time. So let's let's um, let's let's talk about definitions for 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 a second. How do you define illiberalism? Well, um, that's important. Um, I think about it in sort of a number of ways. Uh, obviously, inequality is at the center of what we would think about uh, as illiberalism. But uh, there are a variety of other things that I think are really important. One is the embrace of what you might call uh, assigned or ascribed hierarchies of gender, of nationality, of race. Um, you would talk about the um, desire for cultural or religious homogeneity um, and the marking uh, of internal as well as external enemies. And so in the process of defining uh, that kind of homogeneity, you can see it, it, it could be ethnic, it could be racial, it could be religious in the United States, oftentimes around Christianity. Um, tied up with expulsions, exclusiveness and expulsions, that people who didn't belong there uh, were run out. Um, also, the idea of rights bearing as particularist, as confined to certain localities or communities, uh, but not rights bearing that was in any sense uh, wider or universal. Uh, the idea, it, it wasn't a rejection of rights bearing entirely, but it was an idea that people had their rights were, were based in certain local contexts. Um, and, uh, you know, that uh, th that's uh, quite important. So obviously, uh, the use of political violence as a way to both attain and uh, maintain power. And I guess as much as anything else, <clears throat> what has struck me is the idea of the will of the community overriding the rule of law. And it expresses itself in many different ways, uh, usually uh, to very nasty effect, but not only that. And so um, these are kind of the pieces of the uh, phenomenon that I was interested in, that I thought on the one hand kind of tied this together uh, over time, and yet at the same time, you know, kind of um, sort of shifted. And I'm not saying that, you know, illiberalism needs to be marked by all of these things at the same time, but you can see many of the things, um, you know, uh, uh, emerging and, and being important. Mm -hmm. You know, I, <clears throat> from your prior work, uh, I came to really think of you as sort of 
just expert on the 19th century in America. Um, in this book, you go way further back, way, for, way further afield um, uh, to sort of set it up. There is a lot about the 19th century, but there is, but there's um, other stuff as well. And and so you know, a was that a stretch for you? And b um, uh, talk about the origin of liberal versus illiberal. Um. Well, yes, it was a stretch, um, and I have to confess, as I was writing the book, I also I was always uh, afraid that I was kind of skating on thin ice. Uh, one of the things that actually made it possible for me to do this was I had been writing a U.S. history textbook. Now, it's a different animal, and frankly, I, you know, if I had it to do again, I wouldn't do it. But... <laughs> But it, as a result, I mean, I was just reading all over the place. And, I, you know, I had taught survey courses on many, many occasions. And I was always interested in kind of a big picture and, um, you know, how to synthesize a lot of different things that were going on. Nonetheless, um, you know, uh, I've, I've worried and I still worry that you uh, tread on other people's turf and they, uh, you know, are quick to find out what you do wrong or, you know, explain that you really don't know what you're talking about when you come to this. And that certainly is entirely possible. Um, but I, I've tried to work hard at it and I've tried to write a book that actually doesn't make any claims to being exhaustive. It's kind of episodic. Uh, I thought that what I would do mm -hmm is um, pick out moments in the past. Now, you know, you could do a lot of different things, which is pick out especially ugly stuff, but I didn't think that was gonna be useful. I thought it would be more useful to pick out moments in the past, for the most part, that we associate with the development of liberalism and to interrogate them uh, in a way that suggests another way of looking at it. And the book also begins with a chapter that I call The Invention of the Liberal Tradition. Because in point of fact, however much we talk about liberal democratic norms, this was a new idea. You know, it really comes up in the 1940s and 1950s, not surprisingly in the midst of the Cold War, as writers um, and literary critics as well were interested in you know, emphasizing American exceptionalism. But this was new. I mean, historians who had been writing, professional historians, who had been writing since kind of the advent of professional history since the late 19th century, were not writing about that at all. So I thought it was important to point out, A, you know, it's, you know, the historical aspect of the liberal tradition, and also, you know, maybe, you know, why it hung on. Right. And, and I, you know, I think that was um, a, a really good strategy for the book, and maybe the only one, because um, uh, to, to, to sort of focus in on, on, on moments and episodes, uh, and then describe how these forces sort of, sort of work. Um, uh, you go really far back to before we were a country, right? Yeah. I mean, um, t t talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, you know, uh, one of the things I, I sort of take up in the introduction to the book is, well, how can you have illiberalism before liberalism? And it's a good question. Uh, I try to tackle it uh, by suggesting that when I, I talk about illiberalism, I'm talking about political currents that really go back to feudal and early modern Europe that in important ways are redeployed uh, in the colony, you know, in the uh, North America as Europeans are setting up uh, settler colonies of, um, of many sorts. And part of it is to say not only that, um, you know, liberalism, as I talked about it, predates it, liberalism, but in many ways, it has its lo its own logic that it's not a phenomenon that only develops in relationship to liberalism. It develops on its own. Uh, eventually, uh, illiberalism and liberalism do tangle. And one of the things I try to argue in the book is that in so many ways, 
it um, entangles liberal projects. That in many cases, it's not simply how liberalism uh, fails, but how people who regard themselves as liberals can't untangle themselves. And so it ends up being a very important kind of, as I use the term, field of force uh, mm -hmm. in American politics <clears throat> and society. And in some, to some extent in ways that are not always easy to see because we like to present uh, the American present and the American past in certain kind of terms mm -hmm. and see what I would call a liberalism as explosive exceptions, that this is what happens once in a while. And the term <laughs> backlash itself, I mm -hmm. think, captures that, which is here are people who are enraged. Um, they don't like what's going on. It's not clear what they're informed by except hostility. And then it subsides, you know, eventually to uh, emerge again. The question is, you know, I don't see it that way. I mean, we talk about populism these days, and mm -hmm. having written about the 19th century populism, I find it really annoying. Um, but in point of fact, populism is presented as a menace, right? It's rage. It has nothing to do with a critique. It has nothing to do with a platform, except mm -hmm. marking internal and external enemies who either should be uh, run out or suppressed. So... You know, and mm -hmm. so, so I, I guess also to, you know, get uh, address, I think, the Gene's question more fully. Um, <clears throat> I think that in at many, many points, um, li liberalism, even at, at its most formidable, um, had a very tough time defining itself outside and also to recognize that there are other political currents um, moving through the country historically. Um, you know, uh, we're talking about um, cooperation, uh, you know, uh, cooperatives and, uh, and populism and social democracy and feminism, um, just to name a few, and the socialism, which um, had different kind of ambitions mm -hmm. and try to define themselves, you know, in terms that weren't liberal, even if at certain some points they kind of uh, couldn't escape. So to sort of illustrate this this kind of Janus-faced nature of, 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 good way of, putting of uh, you know, his, historical figures and moments and, and movements, um, one, one person you write about is, is Margaret Sanger, um, who looked at from one side is a, he, a, a hero for her, you know, pioneering advocacy of birth control uh, and, and, and family planning and, and, and that, um, you know, these were radical, liberating ideas uh, in, a, in a really important way. Um, but there was another side, and it, and it was it was eugenics. It was um, you know it was um, uh, as illiberal as it come. Talk a talk a bit about yeah. that. Um, you know, <clears throat> I mean, Sanger is a really interesting point. Who, of course, Planned Parenthood doesn't really want to have very much to do with these days. Um, I have a chapter called "Modernizing Illiberalism," and it's on what we call the Progressive Period. And one of the things that struck me very quickly was, I mean, eugenics is generally treated as a sidebar to progressivism. It's mentioned, but it doesn't seem to be, you know, really um, uh, telling about what progressive thought was. And I found very quickly, I mean, I started the chapter with Sanger, who herself, you know, was a radical socialist. And uh, and feminist, um, and I I um, I found that you know across the progressive spectrum, eugenics was seen as the way forward. Um, the thing I emphasize is the idea of social engineering. Uh, progressivism, in that roughly 1900 to 1920, you know, emerges amidst a widespread critique of 19th century liberalism, and this is uh, happening in Europe as well as 
uh, in the United States, the failure of liberal ideas, the failure of, you know, the idea of liberal and representative politics. Um, uh, and so what I, I tried to do was to kind of redirect um, our attention and then look at the way in which the idea of social engineering kind of penetrates uh, and ends up uh, crafting a really anti-democratic view of how the political system ought to be organized. Um, an argument um, that, you know, really politics should be run by well-educated experts, by bureaucracies, and that, you know, the uh, uh, Jeffersonian democracy of the 19th century uh, was uh, a breeding ground of corruption, not to mention inefficient. And uh, one of the things I saw was that if you kind of combined this idea of social engineering, eugenics, which, you know, it's, it's mm. a horrific uh, record and involves the United States and some of the most important philanthropic organizations with fascism. I mean, the, uh, <clears throat> the Rockefeller Foundation gives Joseph Mengele uh, a, um, a grant to do his research in the 19... Uh, 20s and eugen eugenicists uh, into the 1930s uh, in Germany and in the United States are sharing uh, a lot of their research and feel that they're really in important ways doing the same uh, kind of thing. Uh, there's this idea of a so-called national purpose uh, that ought to be an organizing ground. I mean, this is part of Theodore Roosevelt's new nationalism, who himself you know, was very much interested in eugenics, in recognizing the consequences. I mean, Margaret Sanger talks about this too, you know, of, of the feeble and the um, problems that they pose for poverty and crime uh, in the United States. The feeble-minded, States. right. The feeble-minded. Yeah, yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, this is when you have the first army... Um, uh, kind of psychology tests mm -hmm. which initially uh, determines that like half the population of the united states is feeble-minded <laughs> <clears throat> but this ends up being the foundation of the well i mean you know <laughs> there, there's something to that but you know these were the found this is the foundation of iq tests um mm -hmm. uh, and of tests like the sat and and so on and so forth so what struck me is that if you put this together with uh jim crow with the um, national embrace of um, repression, uh, disfranchisement, exclusion. I mean, the Supreme Court validates this. The Wilson administration validates this. Uh, U.S. imperialism overseas in the Philippines and Cuba. And, you know, the Roosevelt type thing is, you know, we need a war that uh, American masculinity is... Uh, weakening, and this is the way in which we rejuvenate it and rejuvenate sort of the older elites to be ready for, you know, American modernity. And uh, to me, this is kind of anticipates European fascism. I mean, that you know, there during World War One, um, there are the uh, you know pieces of a corporate state that are really coming into being. They were already out there uh, from you know, the late 19th century and turn of the 20th century. Um, but certainly the, the kind of alliance of business and government mm -hmm. um, and the idea of reform as a way of cementing that alliance. Now, it turned out that you know, some of this falls apart, but nonetheless, you know, by the 1930s, it's, in some ways it's kind of you know, reconfigured. So I really thought that, you know, the progressivism, you know, it tends to be viewed in very positive ways. Here's a good example of the state, um, you know, mm -hmm. taking on new responsibilities for politics and maybe economic welfare. And there is some of that. And some of the things that go on in the progressive period are remarkable mm -hmm. for what they're, I mean, out in Oregon, you know, there's a, a people's uh, power movement that proposes occupation as a basis of political apportionment. I mean, you know, think about that. I mean, that's way ahead of our own time. So there's a lot of that going on too, but I think the major kind of directions of mm -hmm. progressivism, and it's not surprising that we kind of look back 
and see that as for some people see it as because they just don't seem to put two and two together. What are they asking for? What kind of world do they want to create? And it's a world that's basically run by a small uh, elite of mm -hmm. people who are either self-designated or socially designated as as experts. So let's let's fast forward a bit. Um, uh, your, your, the, the final chapter of the book is entitled Specters of Race War and Replacement, um, which is uh, kind of um, um, scary, but here we are, right? <laughs> I mean, that's just the kind of thing you hear on an average day these days, um, uh, coming from um, uh, a certain sector of our politics. And, and so I remember, you know, 2008, the, we... Uh, the country elects the first black president of the United States. And, and the first, you know, one of my first thoughts and it, and, and I just got, I remember discussing it with my, my parents, um, who were both alive at that time. And my, what my dad was, was, uh, 92 and my mom was 87 and they were like, they had oh. seen a lot. <laughs> they're like, oh, there's going to be a backlash. I mean, it's coming, it's coming. And I said, yeah, I'm sure you're right. You know, it'll be, you know, at some point it's going to come. I didn't know it was going to come like in 15 nanoseconds, right? I mean, you know, he's hardly moved in before here comes the Tea Party, here comes the, you know, Proud Boys or whatever. I mean, talk about that moment and these forces that, have gathered and are now expressing themselves in the country in yeah, a I mean, um, really scary way. The idea of, you know, specters of race war, per se, has been a long-term phenomenon in American history, you know, ever since Europeans arrived and encountered native people and then uh, began to enslave people of African descent. And it changed over time. I mean, it was... The image of Saint Domingue, uh, the overthrow, you know, the Haitian Revolution uh, during Reconstruction, it was the fear of Negro rule, as they uh, pointed out, and then, of course, with the, you know, civil rights movements of the, um, you know, second half of the twentieth century. Uh, it didn't take long there either mm -hmm. uh, yeah. for, you know, I mean, one of the things that you know really struck me is that. Um, the pushback against um, desegregation or integration of housing. I mean, this is not something that happens after the urban riots of the 1960s. It happens in the 1950s, in 1940s. You know, at any point when black people were pushing, you know, mm -hmm. into neighborhoods again another will of the community you know they knew where the neighborhood lines were and you were not going to cross that and of course they was you they go resumed. back to the red summer of 1919 uh, well absolutely I mean, you know, you know they're, exactly <laughs> they're, they're... and um so one of the things i mean you know gene made the point i mean you know i when uh, obama was elected for a little while while you know the kind of pushback was brewing you know a lot of people said now we were we were a post racial society that somehow or other this was the end of this american redemption story that yeah. we had sinned we had enslaved people we had persecuted people somehow we imagined we could look forward to a, a world in which um, you know, Martin Luther King's vision and so on and so forth. And here was Barack Obama, this extraordinarily smart and charismatic person, the embodiment of um, uh, cosmopolitanism. And that was exactly what made everyone crazy. Um, and uh, it was amazing how quickly... You know, the more you look, I mean, it wasn't the Tea Party, I think, uh, uh, is organized in March. Yeah. I mean, it's, but it's but just, even it, before then, I mean, yeah. in, you know, in November and December, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. And and so this idea, you know, I think becomes very, very important. And then in the context of the upcoming demographic transition, the um, you know point at which some point in the mid 21st century when white people become at least a demographic minority mm -hmm. and uh, I think that ends up playing a really really 
you know, powerful role yeah. in sending fear. But, you know, I guess, um, you know, I, I, I spend a good bit of time in the chapter on David Duke, mm -hmm. uh, who is oftentimes, you know, kind of forgotten. Uh, David Duke was a Nazi and a Klansman. Uh, he organized the uh, his ver the, the a Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. He was down at the border in the late 1970s. Uh, he ran for the Louisiana legislature in 1989 and won, and then very quickly thereafter ran for. Uh, Senate and governor, um, even though everybody knew he had been a Nazi and won 60% of the white vote. And Walker Percy, who lived, the writer who mm -hmm. lived in Louisiana at the time uh, when Duke, um, you know, uh, got elected to the legislature, wrote this, you know, really chilling piece where he said, you think that this is about Louisiana. But this is that he, that <laughs> David Duke is not speaking to Nazis and Klansmen. He's speaking to the middle class. And what's happening here, as he put it, is could easily end up happening in Chicago or Queens. Um, you know, David Duke, Pat, uh, Pat Buchanan, um, you know, carries yeah. this on the, you know, yeah. this idea of America first and the border world and mm -hmm. the preservation of white. Uh, culture um, and the enormous fear of what it means for uh, people of color and especially people of African descent to be in positions of political power. I mean, it's not incidental that, you know, uh, Obama was accused of being ineligible for office because mm -hmm. he was born outside the United States. Now, admittedly, Americans could easily think that Hawaii is outside the United States. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not it. That's not. But, <clears throat> um, you know, but this is a reconstruction racist trope. This is exactly the argument yeah. that con uh, former Confederates yes. made, which is, you know, it was illegitimate. Mm -hmm. to extend the franchise and to extend the Absolutely. right of political participation mm -hmm. to black people who were formerly enslaved, who were by their lights ignorant and incapable of taking care of themselves, let alone uh, mm -hmm. governing um, uh, their cut of the uh, country. And uh, this, you know, I think remains yeah. incredibly powerful. Hey, there's a lot of that here now and and you hear one of the expressions you hear is that um uh you know democrats all there they just want the, these immigrants in here they want to let them all flood into the country because because they're voters they're just trying to get more voters i mean and then and that idea that that this 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 wave of of um unqualified and illegitimate voters is going to come in and take yeah. and exercise power over those of us who have the legitimate right, right. To, exactly. to power. Yeah. Um, you know, clearly uh, from the 1960s on, whatever the limitations of kind of modern liberalism there, you know, it's come to be a sense that uh, the federal government <clears throat> uh, and the Democratic Party in particular has a client population, mm -hmm. a client population of you know, people of color, and that's what sustains them. And therefore, you can talk about the great invasion. Uh, and this is how the Democrats are going to stay in power by, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, continued election fraud that is, you know, going to um, uh, bring them in. You know, one of the things that really changed since the earlier in the 19th century, I think, on the part of a lot of people, uh, was their whole view of, you know, whether the government was interested in them. Uh, in the 1920s, you know, the Ku Klux Klan was the biggest social movement in the United States. And on the yeah. one hand, there was a federal government that wasn't interested in intervening in anything. And the Klan took over uh, at the local level in state legislatures. So the government was working fine for them, thank you. Um, you know, prohibition was enacted, which was clearly designed as an attack on the life ways of immigrants and black people. Uh, the 1924 Immigration Act for the first time established, mm -hmm. I mean, it's only the second one since Chinese exclusion in the 1880s, established quotas 
um, for um, potential immigrants, very local, I mean, almost non-existent ones for Africans. I think yeah. only 100 were allowed to come in <laughs> and Southern and Eastern they Europe. They wanted us before. Uh, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> they didn't want you to come by yourselves no, on your right, own exactly. will. They I mean, it was, uh, the likelihood be, was... Steve, let me, let me ask you one last question. I want to have time for yeah, people okay. to ask questions. So you... You, you cover a lot of the good and the bad um, in, in this book. Do you come out of it, um, <laughs> in the end, do you come out with any hope and optimism? Do you, um, uh, uh, or, or, a, um, or a way forward? Let me let me say, um, uh, even uh, if the way forward yeah. is struggle. Yeah. Well, the way forward is struggle. Um, under any circumstances, I think that's clear. You know, the hardest section of the book I had to write was the conclusion, because you know it's a pretty dark book, and um, I didn't want to finish on an entirely dark note, but I also didn't want to be Pollyannish about it. Like you know, a lot of books out there is how our democracy is dying, and this is how you can fix it. I mean, I don't know how to fix it. Uh, if I knew how to <laughs> fix it, I would be in a different line of work. I'm almost old enough to run for president. <laughs> so, um, but what I tried to do was that on the one hand, emphasizing that a liberal America is a, a very important component of our country. And yet at the same time, recognizing it's not the only thing out there. And I finished with an example that I was always very moved by, which, um, takes place in a, a county in East Texas in the last decades of the 19th century, where a former, um, uh, a guy who was white and whose family uh, supported the Confederacy and owned plantations, formed a political alliance with uh, the county's African Americans. Uh, the reason was that hard times were coming along and the uh, white um, uh, person um, wanted to run for a local office and knew he couldn't win without the support of African Americans. And they do that and there is a process that lasts three decades that they form a really stable alliance and which uh, wins 90% of the black vote. It's in Grimes County, Texas, and about 30% of the white vote, who themselves were kind of insurgents. And they win uh, as uh, uh, running for office on the greenback labor ticket, and they run on independent insurgent tickets in the uh, 1880s, and then they call themselves populists. And they win on the you know populist um, uh, ticket, and they continue. They remain in office even when the populist party nationally disintegrates. And they win in 1898. And as the election of uh, 1900 comes around, uh, the w local white elites decide that they've had enough, and they form an organization called the White Man's Union, <laughs> and they gun down the populist leadership. Mm -hmm. And it not only killed them and destroyed the movement, but in Grimes County, it effectively erased mm -hmm. what was a remarkable yeah. moment of possibility. And so I do think it's important, this is why history is so important, uh, for us to not be blinded by a um, invented past that doesn't want to come to terms with where we've been, but also to recognize important moments when people struggle. And, I, you mm -hmm. know, I think it's, you know, I, I finished the book with William Morris, who is a British uh, artist and poet and socially, uh, socialist. And, um, and he says, people fight uh, and uh, lose. And what they fought for comes about um, despite their defeat. And when it comes about, it's not what they meant. And other people have to fight for what they meant under another name. Mm -hmm. The point is yeah. that struggle is an ongoing process. There's no end point to it. And I think that mm -hmm. what we need, you know, obviously need to recognize is that if you're committed to a different kind of society, then it is a long haul. But it's, it has been done. It has been done. And, and it, you know. You know. 
it's not easy, but we, uh, you know, this is a different place from what it was when I was a kid in South Carolina. Very different. So, you know. And there are a lot of people out there who have been, you know, doing just that. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously people on the left are kind of balkanized at the moment. But um, there are a lot of really committed mm -hmm. people who yeah. do try to envision something else. Yeah. And so, we can only hope that well, we can hope we're not we going to all end up in jail. We can work on it and vote. <laughs> Everybody vote, okay? Um, uh, so um, we have a bit of time, and I wanted to um, see if uh, anybody has questions. Please go to the microphone if you can, and um, we'll be happy. And yes, sir. How does uh, RFK Jr. fit into all of this? Um, he draws from Biden supporters claiming that he is the historical liberal, right. and he draws from Trump supporters saying that he's the centralist. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. And uh, it's clear that his ability to remain in political play has a lot to do with widespread voter disenchantment with both Biden and Trump. Uh, he clearly um, is embraces conspiracy theories and to some extent it appeals to, you know, a public. And I don't, it's not entirely clear to me how things are going to play out. I mean, he's got to get on the ballot and so on and so forth. But uh, I think it's a it's sort of characteristic of this moment of political volatility and uh, and why you know kind of a liberal sense of sensibilities. I mean, I don't think that's a good answer for your question because I I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I'm just you know he's obviously trading on his family's name and um, you know he doesn't really resemble uh, Robert F Kennedy, uh, who has its own his own interesting political migrations. But um, I think he saw a, a, an opening and he's going to try to exploit it as best as he can. Mm -hmm. Hi. Sure. Well, thank you for a very interesting and, talk. And uh, feel free to answer these questions, too. Well, I, will, I, will, I will. I will. That was a good answer. Well, I don't, I don't have a better one. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'll give you a hard one to answer. <laughs> um, I'd like to challenge you mildly, at least, on two important points, I think. One is uh, in the book, although you kind of give a little nod uh, to the fact that uh, maybe on the left there's mm -hmm. a problem too, it's just a little nod mm -hmm. and the, the rest of the book is, uh, you know, just sort of assumes that it's a problem of, mm -hmm. um, of the right. And if I can take a you know, broader perspective than the United States, um, over the past hundred years, <clears throat> the worst autocracies have been on the left. Um, and they haven't all been communists, but the Nazis were socialists as well. Oh. Um, so anyway, first point, I, I think that um, you know, left uh, autocracy on the left is at least as uh, strong a challenge as on the right, although in the American context, you might not think so right at this moment. The second, uh, the second thing that I'd like to be take a mildly different view on, or maybe a bit more than mild, a, a couple of times this evening, people have, have said, use the equality term, as if equality and liberalism are the same thing. Yeah. Not necessarily not so. Necessarily. I've worked mm -hmm. in Cambodia, believe me. Um, some, maybe many of the worst autocracies and the most terrible experiences over the last hundred years have been in the name of equality. So I, I thought, boy, it doesn't sound quite right to me. <laughs> so two points. Mm -hmm. It's not just a rightist problem. And secondly, be careful with the equality idea mm -hmm. when you talk about liberalism and illiberalism. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think those are two very fair uh, questions. You know, one of the things I say to you know take up that issue is i do argue that illiberalism is chiefly a phenomenon of the right uh, in american history but i do make clear that not only in the united states but really elsewhere you know there are certainly examples of uh movements of peasants workers and the poor uh who begin struggling 
for a world of <clears throat> equality and democracy and um, uh, righting the um, uh, the um, hierarchies that existed and then they win and then the regimes <clears throat> organize themselves in ways that you know are autocratic and um, uh, based on loyalties not uh, to human beings or to each other but to a party and to uh, the regime more generally I think this is something that is a uh, you know been a uh, an issue and and will always turn up in movements that <laughs> succeed in getting power and once you know i i think it's kind of you know a way of thinking that you know struggle is an ongoing thing and there's no point at which you say well we won this and now we're good um you know the process of governing of uh trying to create forms of order uh you know raise all of these questions now i i i think there are uh examples historically of um uh, the emergence of regimes at various points that claimed to um, be uh, uh, embodying the uh, struggle for equality and then ended up turning in a very awful direction. I think, you know, they're historically specific things. We really need to understand what ha happens in these places and why the vulnerability exists. But I, I do think in the United States, you know, um, uh, illiberals have been close to power and the left has not i mean i don't know how you want to define it but the fact of the matter is that one of the things that became clear and clear and clear is how much the history of this country has been governed by people who are fairly conservative and who even when they're not fairly conservative are kind of infected by all sorts of illiberal dispositions so um, I do think, you know, there are situational nature, uh, situational circumstances when there are illiberal behaviors on the part of people who claim to be struggling uh, for rights, who claim to be struggling for inclusion. Uh, but I would say that they tend to be uh, situational in, in, in certain kind of moments of reckoning, I would say. And for the most part, however they're branded, they're not, they have no power. I think the danger is people who really are close to power. And I think that's, you know, yeah. one of the mm -hmm. things that's really true. <clears throat> sure. I, I know I've, that's not going to convince you. But. <laughs> I, I've always thought one of the underappreciated events of recent history was the correspondence dinner several years ago where oh, yeah. Barack Obama, Obama, Obama got made fun of uh, and Donald Trump. The parody yeah. of uh, The mm -hmm. Lion King. Uh -huh. uh, do you have any? Any of you have any take on that? And I think Trump is still angry about it because he had to sit there. Well, he get... bears grudges, doesn't he? And so, <laughs> yeah. So it's not the kind of thing he would forget. I mean, I would argue that he was probably kind of on his way by then. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think that's when it. You know, that, that's not the entire origin story. I don't think he had, you know, that's, that's, aha, uh -huh, I think I'll, he you know. He had to sit there and take it, though. Right, but he had to sit there and take it. And <laughs> and I, I agree with you. I don't think he's ever forgotten oh. that feeling, you know. You don't, you never forget how somebody makes you feel. And and, and Barack Obama made him feel very small and, and feel like an object of ridicule. And that's the sort of thing he takes very personally and wants to avenge. I think that may be why, you know, when he's in the middle of his rallies and this and that, he, to this day, he often talks about Obama when he really means to mention Biden or somebody else. And he, and he's, he's, you know, claimed that he defeated Obama at the, you know, which actually, no, you never ran against Barack Obama and, you know, and that sort of thing. So making fun of them sometimes would be a good strategy, perhaps. Well, <laughs> did it work out well? I don't know. <laughs> you know, you could look at that both ways. Uh, but, mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, sir. Hi. Your um, use of the word um, elites and the risk during the um, progressive era that uh, things were sort of heading towards an elitist um governing caste or whatever and that and that it, and 
at that time, that elite was sort of associated with a, almost a scientific elite and an educated elite. And that, that was a sort of a risky thing. Yeah, we've kind of gone through the same thing recently with the pandemic and so forth, and with um, and more just more generally with uh, fear from the what would be the illiberal side of uh, of the spectrum right now being uh, not just afraid of but also um, very antagonistic to mm -hmm. elites in their right. mind including the scientific elite and including Especially. government expertise and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, so it seems to me like there's been a shift almost a wholesale shift in uh, who's on what side with regard to that topic. Um, I, I think that's a that's a a valid and interesting observation. Yeah, I mean, and and um, I, and I think you could you could ask legitimately. Um, you know, I think some future historian will look back at the pandemic period and might have a very different view of it than I do now in terms of who was being liberal and who was being illiberal, um, uh, because we can now, in retrospect look back and say um, that, that maybe there were elite pronouncements, for example, that were, um, uh, uh, were not in the most democratic spirit um, and that were more definitive than they should be. I'm speculating now as to what, but it'd be because, you know, those, um, uh, it, 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 there is also the fact that if that did constitute an episode of illiberalism, in a sense, it also probably saved a lot of lives, and so um, uh, so you, you you have to wait. But it's that's a very interesting question. And I, you know the the issue of expertise. Um, I think you you made a very good point. I mean, this is. You know, something that emerges in the late 19th century with the professionalization uh, of a lot of areas, whether it's medicine or whether it's in the, um, you know, arts and sciences uh, and new groups of people trying to establish their own kind of bona fides and uh, uh, elevating this idea of a certain kind of expertise that is um, acknowledged, branded um, and accepted um, by people who are already powerful and they see themselves as trying to transform the way in which um, the economy is organized, the way in which politics is organized. And I think what, what happened during the um, pandemic, I mean, look, it, 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 it was obviously organized politically, but it hives off a kind of deep suspicion of uh, certain kinds of expertise because of the way in which that expertise has exploited um, all sorts of people. I mean, we certainly know about how the medical profession exploited uh, African Americans and they exploited poor people in general. And um, they, you know, what we've seen over the past century and a half is kind of the rejection of what you might call vernacular forms of expertise. Expertise that don't, that it's not about, uh, you know, going to universities, it's not about degrees, it's about people's situations in their own communities and the skills and gifts that they generate and pass on, not, you know, through, a sta you know, institutions outside, but pass on within those communities themselves and how they were denigrated and pushed aside, not necessarily to the benefit of the people who were supposed to be benefited by this. So I do think that that kind of hangs on. And, you know, we have this really interesting moment, I think, uh, if you compare it to the late 19th century, where when, when people who are, you know, sort of on the right, um, criticize elites. They're not in. They're not criticizing economic elites. They're criticizing cultural elites, intellectual elites. I mean, back in the um, you know late nineteenth, early twentieth century, even among the progressives, you know, there was a, a recognition 
that um, you know the distribution of wealth had become really skewed, that a small number of people owned a great deal of wealth, that they a lot of people felt that they had accumulated it at the expense of the majority of the population. And among progressives as well as populists or you know, sort of labor reformers before them, they talked about a whole variety of you know, ways in which that you know, uh, those imbalances could be righted. What's interesting now is that, you know, people who regard themselves as being squeezed economically, which is probably exaggerated since I think, you know, there's this idea that the white, it's the white working class that is the base of, uh, Trump, you know, of Trump. And I, I don't think that's true at all. But, um, uh, but nonetheless, you know, there, there's not a, an attempt to develop a platform that is designed to um, alleviate, you know, whatever hardships they think that they have, unless it's about putting tariffs, you know, on, um, on cars coming in. Um, yeah. One more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, you know, some of the power of the modern neoliberal movement, you know, has to do with, you know, their critique of the excesses of globalism. So, you know, NAFTA and, you know, similar globalist policies brought hundreds of millions of people in the world out of poverty, but it certainly did lead to the hollowing out of, of certain American industries and, uh, you know, was perceived by a lot of people as... as you know, very, you know, bad for, uh -huh. you know, much, much of the uh, American, uh, uh, you know, worker uh, life. So, you know, the, you know, the weaknesses of globalism have also been manifested, you know, through the pandemic where, you know, global supply chains failed. So I just wonder if your book gets into you know, the, the effect of globalism, you know, on powering, uh, mm -hmm. you know, populist movements? Well, um, yeah, to some extent it does. It's a very good question. Um, you know, I have a chapter called Neoliberals and Illiberalism, and it kind of focuses on, you know, the advent of neoliberal ideas and then the ascent of neoliberals to power um, beginning in the 1980s, but moving through the 1990s because... The Clinton administration did more than the Reagan administration in terms of deregulation. And, you know, I mean, what's interesting is that by the end of the 90s, the attack on globalization is coming from the left as well as, as the right. Um, I think um, in, in many ways, what it, what's going on there to hark back, say, to the progressive period about expertise um, is this idea that is kind of out there. Um, not only among the far right where it is, but among uh, sections of liberal thought. Think about the Trilateral Commission, for example, that is established by David Rockefeller in the 1970s and um, ends up what they're struggling over is whether democracy is an appropriate form of governance in this globalizing world and they're very dubious about that mm. so i think that in many ways um you know the kind of atari democrats who come to power mm. in the mid 1980s and then succeed with bill clinton's election uh, are not necessarily there but it's it's worth pointing out that when Bill Clinton was elected and reelected in 1996 it was the lowest voter turnout since the 1920s and i think their fascination with high tech with their interest in um you know deregulation uh, opening up the sort of free market to you know this new phenomenon that has as we know now if we didn't know before you know has an enormous um uh you know possibilities of power over an exploitation of all of us in ways we, we can barely understand. So I, I do think that, you know, ju just to kind of go back point, if there's a really, you know, there are these really interesting moments. And one of the moments I think about is in the 1940s, uh, Henry Luce, who was um, editor of Time Magazine, uh, it, before the United States gets into the war, like in early 41, 
uh, writes an, uh, uh, an essay called The American Century. Now, he's trying to encourage the American government to get in. He's trying to fight against the isolationist tendencies that are especially prominent in the Republican Party. And he, he has this vision of the future, which, of course, uh, is dominated by American power, American values, um, capitalism. And about a year later, Henry Wallace, who is the vice president and then was kind of kicked off the ticket, has a, a, an answering essay called The Century of the Common Man. And what he's talking about, whatever the gender specifics are, is globalizing the New Deal. And so you have these, you know, really contrasting visions of what a post-war world might be like. And the issue is why, you know, why one effectively wins out and the other one doesn't win out. So I do think that there are there are all sorts of moments in the past when things could have gone in a different direction and didn't. Uh, and I think we need to understand those moments because they do speak to issues of change and what's necessary. I mean, I think what I learned from writing this book is what we're up against. And I mean, that's not a, you know, it, it was a sort of very dispiriting but not, you know, I mean, no, I mean, let's be honest, you know, yeah, when, when people yeah. were talking about, you know, how Donald Trump violates liberal democratic norms, it was a kind of a, a, as outraged as they may have been. It was a comforting idea because the idea was that we had yeah. these kind of, we have you know, the norms, we had normalcy right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. and that somehow or other this noxious weed had grown up mm -hmm. and all we needed yeah. to do was pull it out and the soil was still going to be fertile. And, you know, I, I I think we, you know, more and more people are kind of coming to the conclusion that, yeah. that that's not a useful way, you know, of thinking about the moment now or in the past. And as Gene yeah. said early on, you know, I mean, Trump, you know, if Trump wasn't there, would there be another Trump? Uh, well, I don't think there could be another Trump, but there would lie, the, the groundwork was certainly mm -hmm. there for someone in some ways more dangerous than Trump because he was chiefly interested in enriching himself and not necessarily, you know, this was, not, you know, it wasn't a Hitler mo youth movement, you know, yeah, and think right. about that, you know, still at this point, the kind of demographic yeah. of the 18 to 35 is not going in that direction, whereas yeah. earlier fascist movements really thrived off the disenchantment uh, of yeah. young people and try to offer a different kind of vision well, uh, of a future that they, about the fatherland, nationalism, all this stuff, um, which is not happening now. But, you know, there are other people out there who, you know, who are now plotting yeah. what they're going to do. Who might have that vision. Right? And, you know, who do have that vision. Yeah. It's just a question of how, you know, mm -hmm. they can enact it. So. And uh, I think that, you know, that to me is what's so terrifying about this you well, know, moment well you can't fight it if you if you if you can't describe it and you know if you don't know it and um and and from reading a liberal america i know it a whole lot better so thank you steve and thank you thank all you, for Gene. coming thank out tonight you. thank you yeah copies of steve's book are available at the checkout desk up front he'll be here signing